That's my fancy title. Yeah, from curriculum to mental health practice. It just came straight away, really. And I guess that's what I've managed to do over the last couple of years. Um, and in terms of the aims, what I want to do is to, to give a presentation uh, around the influences. I've been in nursing now for 34 years and uh, as I say, particularly this last six years uh, have been incredibly influential. I want to identify the personnel and the people and the literature that's actually shaped my practice as an educationalist. Um, but I want to focus specifically on some practice examples on how to work through uh, helping people to establish a relationship with voices and particularly to um, uh, you know support recovery orientated practice and I want to share with you that I've got two daughters I've got uh, a daughter about to be 19 in September and I've got a, a daughter that's uh, 15 uh, in, in the next month but my 19 year old is going into mental health nursing in September and in many ways when I developed this presentation I wanted to think what would she really want to hear from an old fart like me, 34 years, been in the system, uh, and I'm thinking this is hopefully what she would want to hear in terms of the influence and how to work with people uh, in a contemporary way. And I'm blown away already, I want to say this morning, with the two presentations, and particularly when Mary introduced what the, co the conference was going to be about, because I was here in 2002, Mick, when we did the psychosocial intervention uh, program in Kilkenny, and uh, you know, for me, Mary mentioned about you being in, in, in an advanced state with regards to curriculum. I mean, it's really refreshing to hear that you've got this high on the agenda in terms of what constitutes contemporary mental health practice, and I'm delighted. So. Um, I want to give, uh, give a little bit of background about me for people who don't know me. Uh, I went into my general nursing first uh, at 18. Uh, I loved it, but I got into trouble for talking a little bit too much to patients. So I thought maybe it would be a good idea to get paid for talking to patients and do my mental health nurse training. So I became a mental health nurse at 21. Um, I worked on adult mental health uh, as a deputy charge nurse for quite a while. Uh, for about a two-year period, but I yearn for that community, the autonomy out there. And I also had a special interest uh, for working with people who experience psychosis. Um, I fell into education in many ways in 1997. I did it to pay for my course fees. I was doing a psychosocial intervention masters at the time. Uh, but I loved it, really. Uh, very nerve-wracking at first, but obviously I've been doing it now for coming up to 19 years. Uh, I enjoy in many ways trying to inspire particularly people to think about new ways of working uh, and to consolidate the really good stuff that's, that people are doing. Um, I've had various roles with regards to, I've been an advisor in psychosocial interventions, I've been a clinical nurse specialist, uh, like I said I've got my masters in psychosocial interventions, I've been coming over to Ireland for I can't believe it, 15 years, Mick, yeah, uh, Margaret. Um, and like I say, I work as an education practice consultant now with uh, the Institute of Mental Health in Nottingham, which is primarily a research institute, but we have a training team, education team, of which I'm a part of. Um, and I guess I just want to mention this guy here on the front, Pete Bullimore. Uh, I was saying to Jimmy Lynch at... Uh, uh, dinner time really. I said, do you believe in fate? He said, yeah. I said, well, in many ways fate dealt m my career a brilliant hand uh, six years ago because I met Pete and I've worked really closely with Pete over the last six years and we've developed a lot of training initiatives and I've learned a hell of a lot from working with him and his team and I, I guess I want to share that throughout the presentation. Um, thankfully, Pete also introduced me to Marius Rom, Sandra Escher, some of you who've worked in mental health for a while will have probably referenced these guys. Uh, delightful people to me. They started this work particularly with voices, working with voices 28, 29 years ago. And uh, it really does feel like that we're on the verge of something now, really, really important. You know, for me, I think we're taking this work from 28, 29 years into something really productive across mental health worldwide. And thankfully, people like Peter uh, and John is spreading the message. 
So, so that's me. Um, I guess I wanted to tell you really how, when I first started doing this uh, uh, job as a mental health nurse, I guess, to be honest, I did accept the medical model of psychosis. Like you say, John, we're enormous, like indoctrinated into thinking, the chemical, chemical cure. Um, and certainly, as a community psychiatric nurse, I often encourage GPs and psychiatrists. I was very symptom focused, looking at, uh, you know, I genuinely believe that medication would help people uh, alleviate some of the distress. Uh, I did witness some successes, but over the years, really, I've, I've, I guess I've managed to observe that in many ways, uh, the debate that's raging at the moment within the user movement and on social media is that antipsychotics and psychiatric medication in many ways can cause more harm than good. Um, so, like I said, the truth's out there, the literature's there, it's a case of reading it and looking, and, and I can signpost you to some wonderful resources that are out there to, to give you the evidence, because like we were saying this morning, we're in the realms of evidence-based practice. Um, but I think Mary mentioned this morning about being nosy. Did he mention no, being nosy? Yeah, well for me it's been being curious, you know, to be actually be interested about people's, you know, sort of lives and biographies, really, really important. And I was always interested around particularly the talking therapies. Uh, and again, going back years ago, I was probably focused a little bit too much on the CBT approaches. But thankfully, as a result of working with Pete and understanding the working through mental health trauma concept, I've uh, managed to develop different ways of working with people. And I'm going to share those uh, within my presentation. So um, I want to put some mug shots up here now, right? These are influences uh, on my career. You're on there, uh, by the way, John. I hope it's a flattering photograph of you. There you go. <laughs> You're in the middle. <laughs> um, Peter Breggin, yeah? Uh, I don't know if you want to YouTube this guy. He, he, he certainly is a little bit of a, uh, uh, an irritant to the American Psychiatric <laughs> Association. Uh, Looks a bit like Henry Winkler, uh, Peter pointed out, you know, on that one, yeah. Uh, and again, you've got Professor Richard Bentall. I met with him last week, uh, and his friends were you, John, isn't he? He wrote some fantastic stuff on reconstructing schizophrenia. Pivotal book, you know, if you want to really look historically about how schizophrenia were created. Goes into great depth around <laughs> Kreplin and Bloiler. Um, you've got Joanna Moncrief, psychiatrist who, you know, the myth of the chemical cure, again, loads of YouTube, uh, really good clips of around, you know, speaking, keynote speeches around, you know, dispelling the myth of the chemical cure. Uh, Lucy Johnston, she was quite a, a radical when I was a, a senior lecturer in mental health nursing at Leeds in uh, uh, 1999. She had the users and abusers in psychiatry, but again, you know, very, very captivating to read. Uh, some really interesting chapters in there. Shaped my uh, style of thinking. Obviously, you've got that guy in the middle that you heard this morning, John. Uh, I love showing all the students who do our accredited courses the YouTube clips. The recent one of you being in, uh, I think, is in Holland uh, with a roving mic. 20 minute clip, really, really good. It is the bad things happen and they fuck you up. Uh, I think that's the title of the clip, like, you know. Uh, and obviously you've got Jackie Dillon. I'm pleased to say, obviously, uh, hear the fact that Jackie comes over to Ireland quite a lot and gives some really powerful stuff. She's done some brilliant work around working through mental health trauma, particularly, uh, you know, uh, looking at dissociative states. She's a good friend of Peter's as well. Uh, she's the chair of the Hearing Voices Movement in the UK. Will Hall, have you ever had Will Hall over in Ireland yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. again, Will, I met Will uh, three years ago in Cardiff, done some fantastic work on uh, harm reduction with psychiatric drugs and looking at minimisation and you know if you've been on psychiatric dr drugs for 20 years it will take you 20 years to come off psychiatric drugs safely. He's done some really good stuff in, uh, in, in uh, America around you know useful strategies for coming off medication safely and some really good health and well-being stuff that's in there. Obviously you've got 
you know, one of the founder HVN activists, and that's Ron Coleman. Uh, some great books he's wrote, you know, Recovery and Alien Concept, yeah, from uh, victim to victor. Um, you know, again, brilliant orator, if you've ever heard Ron speak. Um, and I've put Mary Ellen Copeland, again, quite a lot of people within Ireland, I know are very familiar with the RAP, Wellness Recovery Action Planning. Again, if you look at Mary's uh, biography, she was discredited by the system. She was told by the psychiatrist when she was going to write a book that she was delusional. <laughs> yeah, uh, but thankfully, you know, she's well recognised now internationally. And in many ways, that is what recovery means to me. You know, it's people that have been in the system that have rose above the system and actually developed stuff that will help people who use mental health services. Um, so they're the key people, uh, well, and we've got some other key people coming up, but uh, I thought I'd put them all on one slide. This guy, in many ways, is just absolutely fascinating. I've never met him yet. Um, a lot of people who I know, I have met him, uh, say he's as charming as he is when you see him on the videos. But, you know, the guy, for me, deserves a Nobel Peace Prize, you know, in terms of his work. You know, he's not a millionaire as a result of it. You know, he's, he's not a very popular guy, particularly with regards to the psychiatric system in America. But read his literature. It's absolutely fascinating. He's an, he's an investigative journalist. And the evidence is there, you know. And you might, some of you may perceive this is a radical position, but the, the information is there, honest. So in many ways, I've shaped my when I'm doing any type of uh, mental health training now, I always guide people to, to this, really. And I will guide my uh, daughter to reading these books, you know, when she starts her mental health nurse training in, uh, uh, in Sheffield in uh, September. Uh, you're on there, Pete, actually. The little pink one is a little bit blurred, but uh, again, Mental health recovery, I mean, it's great. When we came to Ireland in 2002, we were just starting to talk, 2002, 2003, we were just starting to talk about mental health recovery. You hadn't got the Vision for Change document, you know, I think it was like we were about 2005-ish or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was a big thing, and it was a big thing for me, particularly at the time with the training team, because they'd not heard of mental health recovery as well. It'd be, you know... Um, so anyhow, fast forwarding on, I think in many ways mental health recovery has become a little bit of a sanitised word, you know, we've taken over it in terms of, you know, sort of mental health professionals, but I guess when you really go back to where this all originated from, originates from, it, it's developed as a result of the user movement. You know, people like your Jackie Dillons, your Pete Bullimores, your Ron Coleman's that have been in the system and Mary Ellen Copeland's and actually have, have educated us in terms of their wisdom, yeah? Uh, and it's a real shame it's taken 200 years plus to get to that point, but, you know, I can retire from my career in two years' time uh, from the NHS, but I'll probably work independently. Uh, but I really do expect to see a change. I think there is a sea change in, in, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of the practice that is out there. Uh, it's totally different to say maybe 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago. And I can remember reading the Rosenham papers, you know, when I did my mental health training in 1982, yeah? And then there was the being, in, being sane in insane places, you know, um, fascinating stuff. But again, you know, have we moved radically forward? For me, I'm still a little bit impatient. I, I, you know, I'm wanting more improvements. The good thing is that we've got a conference like today to share these views and to get you thinking, really. So, uh, so they're the influences. Uh, I guess the other thing I want to identify is that I've learned so much from working with people in practice. And I'm sure a lot of seasoned mental health practitioners that are out there in the audience will agree. You learn so much from the people that you work with. I've been very fortunate. Uh, Peter handed me the baton about four and a half, five years ago to to help uh, co-facilitate the Hearing Voices uh, Paranoia Group at Sheffield. And like I say, it's the 20-year anniversary on the 9th of September. Uh, I'd recommend you coming over, because Marius and Sandra are coming over. It's going to be, a, hopefully, a party atmosphere and celebration. Uh, often is when we get to Sheffield, isn't it, Pete? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But I guess I want to uh, pay tribute to the people that I've learned a lot within that group. We've got a little video clip coming up shortly uh, in this presentation. Uh, we did some work in Czech Republic last year, about that, this time last year, in Bruno, and people agreed to actually have the video uh, to actually talk about the impact that the group had had upon their lives. And also the second part of it, which I'm going to show you a couple of little snippets, is the impact that the Maastricht interviews had and working through mental health trauma. And the two minute, two lots of two minute clips, and I'll leave you to decide, uh, you know, whether or not that's powerful enough. But, you know, as I say, the people that we, I met over the last four and a half, five years, and I'm still in contact with, tremendous, you know, in terms of heroes. I mean, it's talking about recovery heroes there. Um, Peter's office used to be not far from the group, when we used to run the group, and uh, many a time we'd hit, it was more like a laughter therapy group, wasn't it? Like, you know, we had some real giggles and laughs, but equally we would have some really sombre, heartfelt, you know, really deep, you know, traumatic stuff that people would disclose amongst peers, but it was a safe environment. Uh, so again, you know, you can read as many textbooks as you like, but for me, clinical practice, mental health practice, working alongside people, you learn from their wisdom. You know, that's my, I suppose that's what I'm going to convey to my daughter. Um, yeah, you can read as many academic papers as you like, but getting out there, and like I say, it's good that you still refer back to your early experiences, John. Yeah, uh, the eye contact and, yeah, interview style. So, um, he hates accolades, does Pete, but I'm sorry, I'm going to give him one uh, in the fact that I wouldn't have developed the curriculum at Nottingham without him. You've already witnessed this morning how inspirational he is in terms of telling his narrative. There are some people in the mental health system that think that telling your narrative is old hat. Honestly, I hear professors say that, say, oh, well, that was recovery 15 years ago. Well, I would say, urge you to say, well, actually, if you listen to someone like Pete's narrative, and it links perfectly well with the stuff that you talked about, John, in terms of like working through the mental health trauma. Uh, it's incredibly useful. We should always understand people's narrative. We should always hear what people have experienced. And that was the good thing about being involved with the Sheffield group. Uh, with being a nurse, they used to bemoan how uh, some of the difficulties within the mental health system. Uh, but equally, they could see that with me being a, a nurse, you know, that they, you know, I tried to give a, you know, the message that there's some great workers out there, yeah? Okay, so don't think that we're all rubbish. Uh, I remember being at a conference in Sheffield, it'd be about 1994, and there were a Dutch guy, Jan Foudrain, he came over, and uh, conference bigger than this, it was Halifax Hall in Sheffield, he says, uh, hands up anybody who is uh, a, a, a patient with lived experience, hands up any families and friends. He says, my advice to you is to get the fuck out of mental health services. <laughs> and I just thought, oh, don't say that, I'm really motivated, I'm really compassionate, I really want to help people. But uh, I guess I know what he was saying to a point, but you know, for me, the answer is to work in collaboration, work in partnership. We can be incredibly influential in people's lives. There's Sally, was we yours, uh, Pete. But again, going back to Pete, he's introduced me to uh, a way of working that is, uh, in many ways, mind-blowing. And that's in terms of the evaluations, when people do the Maastricht interview and the evaluations, that's often a common phrase that people talk about. It's mind-blowing. Suddenly realise I've got the tips and the techniques to work with people. To, you know, to understand that hearing voices and, and, and uh, experience of paranoia is no longer a pathology, it's their world. You make sense of it, you get people to accept it, you get people to understand it in the context of their lives, and you help people through it, and you guide people in the same way as John's last slide identified that. Uh, so like I said, Marius and Sandra, amazing characters. You know, and like I say, if, if you want to have a trip over to the UK on the 9th of September, you'll meet them in person. They're absolutely unbelievable. Um, so, for me, this is their work, and they also did it with Patsy, I always pronounce her name right, Hagen, Hagen. 
Hagen, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's worth mentioning they didn't do it in isolation. Patsy Hagen is actually also instrumental with regards to the Maastricht interview approach. So uh, there you are, that's our swanky building. Two and a half million pound. Yeah, that'd be what about 3.2 euros? I don't know what the exchange rate is at the moment, but uh, that's the Institute of Mental Health in Nottingham. Um, see if this works. Yeah, see that floor there? That's the Cochrane Collaboration for Schizophrenia, John. Yeah, and uh, I'll let you into a secret, everybody. Down here, over the last few weeks, me and Peter and Bob Johnson, who I'm going to mention in a minute, we've been conspiring against the Cochrane Collaboration for Schizophrenia. <laughs> we've been getting the message out there, you know, that really there is no such thing as schizophrenia. Yeah. Uh, you know, they spend hours upon hours. I've just realised I'm being recorded, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Better be careful. <laughs> yeah. um, they're actually looking for the clusters of genes now. Yeah, not just the one, but the clusters. Yeah. Uh, there's a little uh, uh, concourse there where often they sit round and have their lunch and what have you, and talk about fine wines as well. <laughs> That's fine if they're on their lunch break, aren't they, I guess. But, uh, yeah, so that's our building. This is where we've done our, our curriculum. Uh, this is the curriculum that, again, working with Pete, uh, obviously it incorporates the Maastricht interview. If you look at that, that's the Making Sense of Voices Paranoia and the Maastricht interview. And it's at, it's at level four, which is at master's level, postgraduate study. This is the first one. And again, I know I'm picking on you, John, but I want you to know that the fact as a result of people like yourself, I've developed a curriculum that discredits schizophrenia. So like Jim Van Oss is now saying, you place the experiences of psychosis on a continuum. So that's what we get the message over to people. We use a continuum of mental health model. We understand again the history of psychiatry, which is barbaric. If any new people... Uh, you know, have not been exposed to how things used to be. There's an amazing video on YouTube called The Psychiatry Nightmare. And it's eight minute long clips, and I think there is about 16 of these. And it's incredible. You know, you've got uh, Skinner with his daughter in a cage, yeah, for the all in the name of psychi in, in behavioral science and experiments, yeah. You've got Pavlov, with, not just with his dogs, but you've got actually Pavlov, you know, wired people's jaws through their measuring saliva. Uh, saliva. Yeah, like I so said, the history of psychiatry, uh, 200 years plus, doesn't make for good reading, but you need to, we need to understand where we've come from. And I think in many ways, you know, there's some real positives about where we need to go, but we need to understand what we've in inherited in terms of the you know, the history. Uh, and like John was saying, it is very socio-political in many ways. It's not just about psychiatry being bad. It's, you know, in many ways deliberate. But we need to understand where we've come from to know where we're going, really. I think, I guess that's the thing. OK, so, so that's, uh, in terms of the skills profile, you know, that uh, obviously was the rationale, you know, for developing the curriculum. Uh, are we doing time-wise, Agnes, are we? Uh, so look, yep. 15 minutes left. Yeah, great. Okay. So, uh, there they are, Marius and Sandra. She's an absolute sweetheart. He's a real eccentric. <laughs> He's a real character, is Marius, yeah? I'm, you know, I've picked him up from the airport, Manchester airport, a couple of times, and I've shared a pork pie with... Uh, uh, with Sandra on uh, the Woodhead Pass, you know, on the way back once, and she's a lovely woman. Um, but this book, in many ways, does talk about the Maastricht interview approach, and like I say, in many ways, it's their work that they did with Patsy Hagen 28 years ago. Um, okay, so the other guy that I want to mention, uh, I don't know, anybody ever heard of Dr. Bob Johnson? Yeah. yeah? Have you ever had any? Oh, he's been over here, hasn't he, to, to Ireland, yeah? Uh, how did you find him? Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we two weeks ago he was over in Nottingham, and uh, we had a we had a hoop, didn't we? Uh, 
yet, Pete. Like we, he was there on the first two days. He developed, he, he, he uh, presented his work, which was around working through mental health trauma, the frozen terror, uh, trauma triad concept. Uh, again, if you understand this history, this was a guy who had the most effective re recovery rate at Parkhurst Jail uh, with you know, people that were diagnosed with severe personality disorder, with people who uh, uh, had committed murders, and people who were wrote off, basically. Uh, it was incredibly successful to the point where, you know, his, his, the recovery rate for people who were working with um, was up to about 90%. And in terms of, so that was the human cost. But financially, you know, he was rehabilitating people. The then Home Secretary, Michael Howard, uh, closed him down, he said, these people are here to be punished, not rehabilitated. Uh, but in many ways, and the reason I'm telling you that, in many ways his work lives on in the fact that Pete integrates this work, uh, he's sort of shared this with me, and in many ways <coughs> the case I'm going to show you in a minute utilises Bob's model, and I'm going to just outline basically what that is, yeah? Which is... Uh, actually, I just want to mention that as well. Caroline Ainscog, K2, were a wonderful, we talk about working through mental health trauma and particularly sexual abuse being prevalent. This is an excellent skills practice uh, workshop uh, uh, book. Um, I, know, I knew both of these uh, psychologists, they were from Wakefield. Unfortunately, Caroline uh, died in uh, the year 2000, 43, of a brain tumour. Uh, K2, the last time time I know she's, she's still practicing but there's some really good practice tips within that book and again this is something that you endorse isn't it Peter in terms of a, uh, a workbook but I guess the other thing I want to mention is the uh, asking the question which is uh, yourself John Reed and uh, um, Paul Hammersley yeah so okay uh, so as we've out outlined this morning mental health trauma is prevalent in many, many guises, you know, and it can be incredibly uh, difficult for people to overcome these issues. So it's physical, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, as we're obviously very powerfully portrayed this morning. And the other thing uh, which is often neglected is neglect. If you're made to feel different, if you're, made, if you're told things over and over again that are really negative, you can form an opinion that can be incredibly damaging. And it can be damaging in later life in terms of adulthood. Um, and I think the key thing is it's often found in the narrative. And I've worked with people who have been in the system for 20, 30 years and nobody's ever really explored their life histories. And it's tragic that people can have medical notes that are that big that have been in the system for 30 years and people haven't asked, as we were saying this morning, the very straightforward question is, what's happened to you? Yeah? Not what's wrong with you, with the big, you know, long list of psychiatric diagnoses. Okay, so moving this forward, uh, this is um, Bob's model. And he talks about trauma being a cognitive fog. And it stops you from thinking. And when we were teaching with him a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the, the cognitive blocking, weren't it, Pete? We were talking about, you know, you're actually being stuck, you can't think. Uh, because what happens is that the you know it's in a freeze frame yeah uh, if you do i mean that's real in the the stuff in bold, bold is really really uh, important if you dare not look you cannot see if you cannot see you cannot think yeah and this is really key is that people perceive particularly the fear which is the dominant emo uh, dominant emotion which again is something i picked up from working with pete uh anger being the second but fear uh, you yeah, know, most, uh, all uh, mental health distress is fear driven. If you're fearing something as an infant, you know, it's going to be incredibly frightening. Often people's problems in terms of the behaviour is really, you know, they're not really understood properly because actually you've got infant fear. Now in terms of the model, what we're saying is if you've got that frozen terror as, a, as an infant, you get this brainwashing to fear and it becomes irrational and uh, you know in terms of the presentation you get a lot of uh, uh, you know I mean obviously as a, as a result of the process infants deal with trauma with denial 
and reoccurring uh, exp experience will show that trauma is not over and we must eliminate trauma to fear that uh, uh, what a person needs to continue with their life. Um, so the trauma remains, that's the key thing. You know, so you know, the important thing is to work through mental health trauma. And a, a good way of identifying that is, you see this young boy looking at, uh, in the box, right? Um, Pete, I don't know if you want to, do, do you mind just to sort of explain, you explain it perfectly. Uh, do you mind just... Uh, it's basically, uh, when, when we get a fear as a child, what we do is we put it in a box, it becomes a can of worms. Uh, we set everyone up with a can of worms, with a can of worms, and a can of worms that it closed with the clothes. But when you put that into that box and close the lid, that child goes into denial. But then the emotional development stops. A lot of people you're working with emotionally will be children. That's why we have to open that box. Yeah. So I'll show you this afternoon, there may be not be one box, yeah. that's why you need a construction, a full narrative, there might be 20. And you have to start in a systematic way on how to open them. Yeah, so imagine that young boy, thank you Peter, uh, having uh, some form of uh, psychological sexual abuse. There's only two things he can do, and that's one, you know, he can dis disassociate, you know, sort of uh, from the experience happening, and the other is putting it in a box, and like you say, that's the can of worms never to be opened, right? Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate how we managed to work with a guy called Michael in a minute. Um, but it's really, really important in terms of the engagement process to, uh, and again, this is a, a Bob Johnson uh, uh, depiction of, you know, you know, before we can get anywhere in terms of the engagement thing, we need to understand truth is really important, what's out there, trust being the antidote, and consent is the uh, mechanism that empowers people. Um, now, I want to introduce you to Michael, as I say, he was very keen to uh, uh, allow me to, you know, give you a little case snapshot of the work that I undertook with him. I did do the Maastricht ass uh, assessment interview for voices. Uh, what that actually revealed is that he had a number of voices and they were linked to his past traumas, particularly physical, sexual uh, and uh, psychological abuse. His sexual abuse was, he was abused from the ages, just listen to this, from the ages of 3 to 16 by his dad. Yeah. When he presented at the group in Sheffield, uh, he presented as having one dominant voice which was screaming all the time at him. And uh, he couldn't work it out, right? Uh, and as a result of the profiling he was in the Maastricht interview, we, were mani we managed to actually allow him to, uh, uh, to construct an identity of the voice here and experiences, which were really, really helpful for him. Because beyond the screamer voice, he had four other voices, which were, right, the screamer, and he managed to identify that that was him as a child. So again, imagine the abuse occurring from three to 16. Voice two, uh, he described it. We encouraged him, obviously, to give a, a name, as we do with the Maastricht interview approach, was the critic, and that was his dad. What he also revealed as a result of his, his upbringing was in South Africa, and he had an horrendous uh, school experience as well, not only from a point of view of being bullied, bu bullied by bullies, but also he had school teachers that uh, dished out lots of not only physical abuse but also psychological abuse in terms of the things that they said to him. Now another voice came about as a result of doing the interview. He then suddenly realised not only there was a Mr E, there was also a Mrs P. Yeah. So with the result of uh, doing the interview, uh, we identified the characteristics and I haven't put the frequency on here Peter. If you ever do the Maastricht interview with Peter you'll see uh, if you've done it already he has a green pen. Yeah, he would have wrote a green pen on there because I've not put the frequency of these experiences. But the uh, characteristics of the screamer, male, six to eight years, screams loudly, high-pitched tone. Voice two is the critic, right, male, 45, negative, derogatory, mean and critical, both in content and tone. Mr Nasty, right, male, 45 years old, abusive comments, shouts and says nasty things. Voice four, the distractor, right, genderless uh, in terms of, you know, not having any sex, 
uh, weird distracting noises, medium to high. So, in terms of the history, this is when it gets really, really interesting. And in terms of revealing, particularly for Michael, uh, he, his voice, particularly the screamer, and this is like, in, in terms of the impact, uh, started uh, eight years ago, when I saw him, it was age 34, uh, but this happened eight years ago. His father was arrested for child pornography images, and as a result of his arrest, Michael was arrested. The police arrested him for, and, and didn't charge him, but as a result of that trauma, uh, uh, Michael was interviewed and interrogated by the police, and obviously that's when the screamer voice uh, occurred. Now, the critic began when uh, 18 years ago, age 16, and that's when his dad stopped abusing him, and again, that was relevant to the school teacher to uh, being a critic. Uh, voice three, Mr. Nasty, started 13 years ago, and that's when he moved from England, from South Africa. And again, we've got a profile of when the distractor began. That was at high school, age 13 to 14. Uh, and in terms of the triggers, I'll let you read those. There's a number of triggers in terms of what activates his voices. So already we're getting a profile of his voice hearing and experience, which he never had before. And you're going to hear in a minute what he found useful about the process of doing this uh, type of work. Okay. So in terms of content, and I'm really sorry here, Agnes, but I managed to, uh, uh, that one slipped through the net. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether you've got a profanity alert on your email, but uh, we get them at work, do you? <laughs> yeah? So, but actually, when you read this stuff, it's pretty grim, isn't it, really? When you think you experience this on a daily basis. Yeah? Really nasty stuff. No positive stuff at all. And this one in particular, you know, imagine doing something in a social situation and all of a sudden there is this, woohoo! Yeah? And I'm thinking, where the hell heck's that come from? Like, yeah? And that used to amuse him, but actually also used to freak him out, he used to say, in terms of like, you know, making him feel very nervous. Okay, so, I think the main thing I didn't point out is that this is the construct, this is the final part of the interview, the report, you, sh you must always have a construct to the report before you do any therapy work. So I'm shortening it in terms of showing you the condensed version of the report, which is a construct. And the good thing about the Maastricht interview, it, it distills the information right down to identifying who his voices are, what they represent, and how they manifest themselves as problems. So as you can see, quite simply, I've just told you the potted history of his, uh, of his life. Uh, his voices represent his father, school teacher, bullies from school. And they represent frustration, shame, anger from sexual abuse from his dad, feelings of fear, insecurity, and powerless, loss of identity. And at the time I got supervision from Pete, and we also identified that also there was deep hidden anger towards the, his mum, uh, you know, particularly for not stopping the abuse. How long have we got left, Agnes? Thank you. All oh, right, okay, yeah. Uh, look. Okay, right, okay, nearly there. Okay, so uh, just want to identify the trauma triad work. This is Bob Johnson's work, uh, is that you actually get people to reenact in a safe environment uh, uh, through a role play scenario. And with Michael, we did it with chairs. We got him to face his abusers as a 34 year old adult. We got Michael, young Michael to feel safe, and uh, I said, where would a place of safety be for young Michael? It'd be in the bush, in South Africa, yeah. So then we got 35-year-old Mike, 34-year-old Michael to look at these chairs. We worked in terms of the hierarchy with the bullies first, and we got him to say, what you did was wrong, I'm angry at you for doing it, and I'm gonna stop you from doing it again. Now, initially, he's six foot three and a bit, is uh, Michael, he's very half-hearted, I was saying it, going to say it over and over again and he said it in a very very powerful way they've got to stand up and say it and particularly when he was doing the bully uh, working through the bullies uh, he revealed and what you did was wrong and you put fucking iron filings uh, filings down my back and it made it red raw and he's thinking oh this is really really powerful stuff and uh, 
And I asked him at the time, I said, what, you know, what was that like? He said, well, I've faced up with him, haven't I? As an adult, can't believe I've done that. He was shaking with fear, but actually he felt really, really proud that he managed to start, stand up to the bullies. So in terms of the trauma triad, we got him to do just, not just that with the bullies, but we got him to actually say the things he needed to say to his mum, to his dad. Uh, but also, more importantly, uh, we also got him to write letters to himself as a young child, as a young Michael. And again, in terms of the workbook that I've talked about, the Caroline Ainsco K2, and it's a suggested technique some of you may be familiar with. So just have a look at this, right? These are his words, right? Okay, the second page coming up in a moment. There you go. So this is young Michael. This is at the time he wrote the letters, he would be 35. What I, wanna, what I want to ask you is what's the letter done for him? Just put your hand up if, uh, and just shout out. What's the letter done? Part of his inner child, his younger self. Yeah. Mick? Take away the blame. Yeah, so, and I think the other is he's trying to support him, he's trying to give him love, he's trying to connect with a young Michael that he was disconnected with for so many years. Uh, be powerful. Pardon? Be powerful. Yeah, to feel in control and to feel yeah. as an adult, really, I guess that's the main thing. Um, I received this email. Uh, about a week or so later. What he revealed is that from screaming, he then started to hear this, yeah? Which I thought was fascinating, yeah? Now what was even more fascinating is he wrote a second letter, and this is it. very moving isn't it yeah. yeah he's conveying compassion he's conveying love but as you completely say he's taking control he's trying to heal the rift he's trying to deal with that yeah okay um i'm aware of time so i'm just going to quickly uh, also identify that he wrote letters to his uh, if i had more time i'd show you the letters to the teachers that they were even better they were fascinating very graphic brilliant yeah Okay, but what I want you to do uh, is just think about how Michael is now, yeah? He's attending his local Hearing Voices group pretty regularly. He's a co-facilitator. He's got relationships with his voices, more, more importantly, and he accepts them. Uh, the experiences have changed. When I rung him uh, two weeks ago, he says, I've actually got a new voice, it's genderless. Actually, the interesting thing, it's, it's positive. So who do you think that might be? He says, well... Could be me. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah. I think more importantly, he's got a role uh, with uh, a helpline with Sheffield. Uh, he's slowly coming to terms. You're going to hear in his words in a minute. Uh, I'll probably just show you him rather than. Let's have a look. Yeah. Okay. So here's the test. Uh, are we okay for another four minutes? Yeah. Good. Agnes, you're giving me preferential treatment. I don't mind. Okay, so actually, this is Bob first, yeah, and then I'm going to fast forward to Michael. Thank you very much, Bob. Two minutes. Part in this short interview. We're going to try and capture the impact of uh, what the magic interview and the uh, work through about how trauma uh, approach, therapeutic approach is out on your lives. Uh, I don't know, Bob, if you want to start, um, you start this work, it would be three years ago. Three or four years ago. Yeah. Um, well, for starters, prior to three and a half years ago, I didn't have a life. Right. Uh, the master to me, I was introduced me to uh, discovering a new life, uh, in which I am in command and not my voices, or my family. Uh, the main thing that I've got from the master interview is the, the way to handle my responsibility, the way to control my fear, the way to be 
for it this month. So uh, how confusing did you get through the voices were? Um, no, I've, I've got a, a name for, I've got seven voices. I've right. got a name for every voice. And it was, is it important to have an identity to the yes. voice? Yeah, yeah because my voice is telling me at what point in my life I hit my trauma yeah. that caused them to appear. And the way in which it was dealt with in the mass streets was a very soft and subtle way to do it. So it built up like a hierarchy? Yes. And it made connection with trauma that happened to you in your life? Yes. Did it allow you to talk about voices for the first time? Yes. Uh, initially coming to the voices group in itself gave me that power to do it. Uh, but the mastery which has taken me further <coughs> is taken me to universities, hospitals, just about everywhere you can find a student yeah. to tell them what the master has done for me. Um, is okay. Get the message. That's Bob. Yeah, obviously, I just want to quickly move on to Michael. 28. 58. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lee. Michael, uh, you did some work with myself around the master interview. You've, uh, uh, you sat down, uh, we didn't have a room booked at first, we did the first session in the car, and yeah. he prompted you for half an hour, but we didn't want to lose that opportunity. But when we finished the interview, um, I wrote told what you actually said. Uh, can you remember what you said about the whole Nostrand interview process? You said? It was all inspiring because you asked questions that I've never been asked before. And um, it makes you think in a different way. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was because you've not been asked those questions before, very revealing, uh, yes. again, uh, helpful to understand. You've got five voices and you've never had any identities again. Uh, you were able to build in a hierarchy. And again, like the rest of you, were able to link it with the trauma that happened to you in your life. Yes. What's the most interesting to you, approach them to you? Uh, uh, how has it helped your life uh, specifically? Um, it's made me feel more confident and it's helped me understand my voices because yeah. when I was I felt I was running around like a headless chicken because I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. And when I had the master interview, that changed and I could start to understand the voices and it made, made more sense what was happening. Yeah. And is it useful, the four of you, all <coughs> having been through the same process, being involved in hearing voices, having a new group? Okay, we'll stop it there. Um, any any comments about that? Uh, <laughs> does that speak for itself in many ways? Yeah, uh, I think very brave of people to uh, do. You know, I mean, these are people who were really shy and introspective when they first came to the group, but we were really proud to show that in uh, Czech Republic, weren't we? Um, we need the interpreter, didn't we? <laughs> There's always a bit of a delay. Okay, so I just want to conclude with this w w final slide. These are the tips I'm going to give to my daughter. All right, understand the person's narrative. As John said this morning, ask what's happened here as opposed to what's wrong with you. Advocate compassion and have interest. Don't underestimate your role as a worker, how you can be that turning point, that change agent. Uh, enable and assist people. Case management, those practical, simple ideas that uh, Pete says PSI is not just psychosocial interventions. Uh, Recognise the harmful effects of medication, offer people health promotion, and help a person to work through mental health traumas. And this is the final one. Get involved in your peer support initiatives, particularly around hearing voices and, uh, and paranoia. Don't just see it as the independent sector. I mean, for me, it was the best four and a half, five years of my career so far been uh, uh, able to chair. Uh,
a hearing voice or co-facilitate a hearing voices paranoia group. I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, over to Agnes. <laughs>